Years ago, there was a movie I used to watch with my family called Captain Ron, and it was a really good movie. And in that, Captain Ron was kind of like a drunk sailor dude that they hired to help them with their uh, boat expedition. And he was always kind of sideways and tipsy. And whenever he said he knew something, he'd say, oh, yeah, I learned about this or whatever. He'd say, yeah, I learned that in rehab. And I always wanted to be able to say learn that in rehab, but I never thought I actually would have to go to rehab to say I learned that in rehab. And today on Talk Sober, we are going to talk to you about some of the things that we learned in rehab as a, I was a 34-year-old drunk who couldn't quit drinking even if my life depended on it, ended up in a mental hospital, ended up going to rehab, ended up having to have help to quit drinking because that is what the alcoholism does to us. It makes us to where we have to cling to alcohol so that there is really no other way out, nothing to do. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about some things that we learned in rehab, some life lessons that we learned, and some of the mindsets that change. So if you're new, welcome here. And Terry, what are, what are some of the things that you learned in rehab? What was your story like? leading up to rehab how did you know you needed help everything like that <clears throat> well um you know i knew for uh, a few years that i was probably an alcoholic i didn't really understand exactly what an alcoholic was but i knew that i couldn't quit and uh well i maybe i should uh actually say that i wasn't sure that i could quit i thought i could as i took that walk down to the liquor store every day and said this is the last bottle and it never was but uh uh, you know, life just got worse and worse. Those uh, consequences just got worse and worse. And um, eventually, and I don't know why, I wish I could tell you what what specifically made me reach out for help, but I did. And I reached out for help. I knew I had to do something like a rehab. I was preferring an outpatient rehab, but uh, there was really no way that I could do that. I needed to be taken away basically. And, um, I, I ended up going into rehab. Um, the people that were like my brother and a good friend, they helped me find a rehab clo fairly close to me. And I went reluctantly. So, you know, leaving my dog and in my house and the comforts of home and all that, not, not knowing what I was getting into when I was going, I mean, that, it was super scary and, you know, leaving, all the all the things that that made me happy and then going to this thing when i was all messed up not feeling well and uh you know when i got to rehab the the first thing they did was um they took care of my detox i was still quite drunk when i got there and um they started to put me on some uh, detox medications and uh basically uh put me in a detox room and I was really, really messed up when I got there. Um, I was pretty messed up for a few days, and the detox was pretty bad, but the medicine definitely made it a little bit more tolerable. And uh, you know, there was things like things like uh, like I could barely I could barely eat because my I was shaking so badly I could be literally I couldn't bring the fork or the spoon to my mouth, and I had to drink with the straw because I couldn't hold the the water glass or the juice glass up to my mouth without spilling it everywhere. But, uh, um, you know, getting through that, um, I started to feel a lot better. And, uh, after about five days I was feeling okay. And, um, that's when they put me, uh, in with everybody else. And there, what was there, Marcus, like 28 people, something like that. Yeah, it was somewhere around there. And we started joining the, the, group sessions and hanging out with people in the the smoking section outside and all that stuff and there wasn't a lot of activities and especially while on the detox meds for a couple of weeks had to uh, I wasn't allowed to go on little walks around the campus at all and stuff like that because uh, they were afraid that something might happen but um, mainly it was uh, those classes started to teach me about alcoholism and uh, that's that, that was uh, pretty important to learn, to learn how this disease works and how it changes our mind and changes our brain and changes the chemistry of us. And it, and it changes uh, our brain chemistry permanently. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can stay away from the drink, um, even though our brain chemistry might be changed permanently, we can live a completely normal life. 
and um, go back to the way our brain was before we got into the addiction. But uh, I learned that, you know, once once that drink comes in, my brain goes crazy. The obsession of the mind, the compulsion of the body um, just kicks in and there's it's virtually impossible to stop it. And so I learned all about how you have to do whatever you can to not take that first drink. And, uh, you know, and le- learn many other things. You, you know, there was there was a lot of benefits of being in rehab. And I mean, the first one was just basically I was in a safer environment and I could heal, you know, and that was that was uh, really important because at home I could easily go to the liquor store or whatever. I was living alone, just had a dog and that's it. And um, that was that was definitely beneficial. And then obviously the detox, the medical staff that was there, they were able to take care of me. And, um, I remember being there, the ambulance had to show up for a couple of people just, and that's, and what would have happened if they were home alone? You know, I mean, it could have been much, much worse. And, uh, the people that got taken away, they came back and they were, they ended up fine. So the medical help was huge. And then obviously I learned a lot, you know, and with, we had, the recovery classes all day, then and they hit every aspect of recovery from from what I have to do and what's happened to me to what the family might do and how I might deal with them and deal with the outside things and all the way to getting a game plan when I go back to the real world where there is alcohol available. Um, but that you know. That was that was an important thing too. Was the fact that I was away from alcohol. You, it's easy to stay sober in a rehab facility because they don't have any alcohol there. So, you know, I had to I had to learn what to do when I got out, and it became available again. Yeah. And you know, and the the other thing was is um, the there's counselors there, and they'd meet with you or meet with me, and and um, they were able to personalize my treatment a bit. And um, that's something that you may not get in an outpatient rehab or just trying to get sober on your own. They're they're able to really, these are people with a lot of experience in recovery. And so they've seen a lot of things and, and they see how people are. They're able to understand me in some of my situations and they're able to personalize that treatment. And, yeah. you know, the, the other thing was that was huge is they taught us relapse prevention and how to cope with stresses and uh, little things you might not think of, of like maybe it's the little thing that drives us to take that first drink. And I never thought about that. I thought it would be a, a death in the family or something huge that was going to drive me to the drink. But it can be as easy as a broken shoelace is what the, what the, uh, the comparison that they used. I, I remember that. But yeah. uh, the, the other thing was living, you know, living with 28 people that are that are pretty much trying to get sober. I mean, there's a couple of people there that were just ordered there by the courts and they just had to do it. But most of them really wanted to get sober. And even those guys, they wanted to get sober, but did they deep, deep down want to? I, I don't know about that. I'm not them. Mm-hmm. But uh, the other thing was, is, you know, going to rehab, I thought everybody would just be, oh man, Terry's a loser and da, 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 da. No, I, all my friends, all my family supported this move. They were like, good for you, way to take care of yourself, you know, and that's, that was my experience. And then, um, you know, another, uh, you know, they had, they have aftercare, but I ended up going a, a little bit different direction, but I still worked, work, worked and work on my sobriety, um, consistently. Um, uh, but they offer aftercare. They have alumni support. I've gone to a couple of alumni events and those are pretty cool. And I'm able to talk to the residents that are there and tell them my experience and how I'm staying sober now. And that's, that was helpful for me when I was there and those guys were talking to us. So there's, there's lots of benefits for rehab. Um, for me, the, the most important thing that I see is, um, when going to rehab, it, you really, really have to want to quit to drinking and, you know, sobriety is your own responsibility, but, uh, we Pretty much my experience has shown that uh, we need help if we're going to get sober. It starts with us, but it ends with a lot of support. 
Absolutely. And I think a lot of it, too, is, uh, you know, we're looking for this, I, I want to quit for the rest of my life kind of feeling. And I never really had that um, until I went to rehab. And I think one of the most important things I learned in rehab was that I needed to at least have an option of alcohol needs to be off the table for at least a long period of time. It needs to be off the table, not, oh, you can have one light beer at lunch or one half glass wine at dinner. It was like I needed to have this off the table. And uh, what rehab really taught me, because I, I was a junkie for self-help stuff. I was a junkie for reading Tony Robbins. And I read, um, you know, medical journals about uh, how the brain works. And I read about neuroscience. And I, I was trying to find a neuroscience rehab to go to. But there was one in San Diego. And they took like nine people every 10 years or something. And it cost a small fortune. And I, I was really wanting to go to something like that. Um, and I'm glad I didn't because that's not what I needed. I didn't need more knowledge. And that was something that I had to figure out because putting more knowledge on a drunk brain just makes drunk knowledge. And you know what you're like when you're drunk. You know what other people are like when they're drunk. They're not rational. And here I was, and I had this mountain of self-help to lean back on. I could solve your problems. I could probably help you get sober even when I was a drunk. I yep. knew what to say. I knew what had to happen. I knew all the stuff. But the problem was is I couldn't help myself. And the reason I couldn't help myself is because my pride and my ego got in the way of forgetting that I was a human being. I, I thought I was some evolved, you know, self-help kind of pillar of knowledge rather than, no, you're a human. And if you don't eat for a day, you're going to be cranky. You're a human. If you don't sleep, you're going to suffer from insomnia uh, issues where, you know, maybe you don't think straight. If you drink you're going to have the effects of drinking. And one of the things I learned in rehab was to blame the alcohol. Because for some reason, us alcoholics never want to blame the alcohol, probably because we don't really want to give it up, and we don't understand that it's causing all the stuff. We say, how does this one drink cause all these issues? How does this happen? What is going on? It can't be the drink. It can't be. Because I see Ted and Sally and Joe, and they're drinking, and they're fine. Why am I not fine? It must be a problem with me, not with the alcohol. And so we look for ways and, and go to therapy. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on therapy. I read books. I went to uh, online outpatient rehab, which was good, but it wasn't for someone who needed to get sober. It was for someone who was already sober for a while. Right? It wasn't very good for, for like drunk people. And I really didn't know what to do, even though I knew what to do, because a lot of you guys listening, you listen to the stuff we say, and you say, yeah, that makes sense. It totally makes sense. I get it. And you start to feel better about things. And this was the detriment of my sobriety in the beginning, was feeling better about stuff. Hey, I got this covered. I could stay sober three weeks. Like, dude, three weeks. I could stay sober. What's your problem? I don't have a drinking problem. Alcoholics can't stay sober three weeks. I must not be an alcoholic. And what happened was all this knowledge and all this stuff would work for a time, but I didn't have the tools in order to deal with certain things that happened or deal with just long-term sobriety. I wasn't prepared. And I had to learn what alcohol did to my brain. I had to learn that, hey, look, when you put one drop of alcohol or two drops or whatever it is, it affects your brain in a certain way. Now, it might not affect the same way with someone else you know. It might not affect the same way with, with this person. But for me, this is what it does. And once I realized that, and it was a big thing that had to go from my head to my heart to understand, one, this is a problem with the drink. Two, this is a problem with what the drink does to you. And you can't go around thinking about, well, this guy drinks and he's fine. It doesn't matter. How's it working for you? And we've proven to ourselves, I proved to myself thousands of times that I can't have one. Thousands of times I proved it before I went to rehab. I knew in my head, yeah, dude, if you don't have drinks, you won't get drunk. Pretty simple. End of story. Give me $10,000 for my advice for rehab, right? No. It has to go from your head to your heart to where you understand without a doubt that this is is the issue causing all the other issues in your life. No, Marcus, you don't understand. I was, uh, you know, 
hurt as a child or I was this or I was that or, or my mom or my wife, if my money situation, if all this, I had that too. You got the what ifs and you got the fuck it's and you got the um, because, because of this. I am an alcoholic because of this. No, you're an alcoholic because you drink and you like what it does to your body and your mind. That's why you're an alcoholic. And those are things that I had to learn in rehab because I thought I could outthink this. I thought in my evolved state of brainism, which I later found out, I'm probably as smart as like, I don't know, a piece of wood, right? And I had to figure out, you know what? I don't have all the answers. And I had to humble myself and say, you know what? Maybe this guy who I previously probably would have looked down on, like here he is, he's like, wear sweats every day. Like, I don't do that. I wear shirts and pants and shoes. I don't go outside in sweats, and this guy does. And I had to learn that maybe, maybe someone I don't particularly care for could have an answer I'm looking for. Maybe, just maybe. And you know what? They did. And even though their story wasn't exactly like mine, the alcohol part was always the same. Without fail. It was always the same. And that's why a lot of times we can relate to people. And, and I think that rehab really taught me, you know what, this is an issue with the drink and you need a defense against the first drink. And that is what sobriety is about. What's going to defend you from taking the first drink? Because if you never take the first drink, you cannot get drunk. I guarantee it. With the exception of this weird syndrome that happens where your body produces alcohol, which happens in one out of every like billion people. But that's the only other way you could get drunk without drinking. <laughs> that's the only way. And I've never met or heard of anyone even closely related to anyone I know that has had that issue. So we have to look at it and say, this is a problem with the drink. And I am so grateful that rehab gave that to me. I'm a little bummed out that it took that much drama in my life to bring me to that conclusion. And that's part of what this channel is about is, hey, if we can get you to the conclusion a little faster than we did, maybe we could save some lives or some marriages or some finances or some people from some really bad things. Jails. Right. That's where a lot of alcoholics end up. You say, well, I'm a I'm a hardworking person. I wear a suit to work, Marcus. You don't understand. I have to wear a tie. It's like, well, yeah, people in ties can be drunk, too. People can deal with all kinds of things. All sorts of things can happen. And you got to focus on what you're going to do. And you got to focus on the humility to say, I could be like that. I could be I, I could fall asleep in the gutter and hit my head because I'm drunk. I could do that. I could be homeless for years. I could do that. I could be anything. I know I could be anything because I was pretty close to it. And you don't even have to get close to it to realize it. You just have to realize how much this changes your brain. Yeah, it a lot does. Of people, a lot of people talking about sober October. You want to take some comments? I'm going to grab something real quick. Oh, sure. Um, Ryan says, what confused me is for many people I talk to, in AA rehab was not the silver bullet for their long-term sobriety. Only know one guy who had worked for for the first and only time. Thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, you know, so they have statistics, and, and if you ask a lot of the rehab facilities, they're going to give you these 97 80% you know, success rates. And then if you talk to an independent people, they're going to give you much, much lower um, success rates. And really, it's all, it's very, very arbitrary. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of factors involved in, in the success rates of rehab facilities and people that stay sober. And, and really, the number one is, which I already mentioned, is does the person going to that rehab really, really deep down inside want to quit? Because that's that's probably the most important factor. But the, and we're going along with that. Other factors are some people are ordered to go there from the courts or ordered to go there from their family or whatever, or they're going to rehab for a different reason to get, to get whatever back, get custody or something like that. And a lot of times that may not be a reason, um, for other people, maybe they just weren't quite ready. 
Uh, I did drink when I got out of rehab, but um, I stopped soon after. And uh, so you could call, you could say that it it wasn't successful for me, but I think it was. I learned a ton, and it was part of my journey to sobriety, and it was key for my sobriety. And uh, it the statistics and all that as far as uh, as far as success for rehab, they don't matter if you're able to stay sober. And, you know, if you don't drink one day at a time, you have a 100% chance of staying sober. So that's that's a statistic that I go with. Um, I do know a lot of people that went to rehab one time and they stayed sober. That's the majority of the people that I know that have gone to rehab. Um, I know lots that have gone many times. And I wish I could give you an answer as to why they're not able to stay sober. Um, if I was able to give you that answer, I would help them stay sober. That's for sure. But, but uh, all I can do is try and, and go with my own experience. And it was very effective for me. Our rehab, um, you know, there's a lot of different types. Well, I guess I don't want to say types, but different uh, rehabs, the way they do things. There's the hoity-toity ones, the Betty Fords and all that stuff where... You know, you get the massages and you get to ride horses and all that stuff. And um, ours was uh, an old hunting lodge and it had rooms, uh, two floors of rooms. And uh, if you were in the upstairs room, you boiled. If you were in the downstairs room, you, f you froze at night. Uh, they gave us food. They had videos. We did not get to watch football. We did not get to watch any video we want. The TV was just just for sobriety videos, and they taught us about uh, recovery. And it was, uh, I don't know, I guess, I, Marcus, would you say it was a pretty basic rehab, but it was effective, and I really uh, do appreciate the way that one was run. Because it, yeah, it was run by sober, uh, most of the people that worked there were sober alcoholics, and they had a nurse that wasn't an alcoholic and stuff like that. But most of them were sober alcoholics and that had... Uh, been there and done that so they knew uh the the struggles that we were going through and they knew how to address them yeah i think the what i liked about it because i w i was going to go to a foofy rehab um but we needed one last minute and you know without flying me somewhere that was one that we could drove uh, drive to um and i think i think it was a blessing in disguise because i needed a no nonsense no drama way to do it um, and there was drama. I mean, you know, there's always drama. There's always house drama. When you put 30 people in a house together that don't know each other, that want drugs and alcohol and can't get drugs and alcohol, you're going to have drama. Yeah. Um, and there was some drama and it was easy to get caught up in. Um, I was kind of like a teacher's pet kind of person. Uh, not because I wanted the accolades or the, the notoriety, uh, because I wanted to learn. And I was like, look, if everyone else here is, is here because they have to be, you know, I'm paying out of my pocket, like I had to pay cash for it. Um, so I'm going to learn everything I can. And I took notes and I talked to every counselor there and I, I, I talked to him about everything. And no matter what, I think one of the important things that I learned was being able to tell your story and get no reaction. Right. Because what I was used to. Right. I had a, a career, which is still my career today, where people listen to me. You know, and if I say something, oh, hey, sorry that happened to you or hey, whatever. Uh, and everyone always responded and reacted to whatever I said. And it was almost like a coddling. But when I got there, it was like, here's my story. And I'm expecting everyone to weep and applaud and stand and, oh, bless you, child. And it was like, OK, thanks. Next. And I was like, wait a minute. My shit really doesn't matter. All this stuff that's hanging me up, all this stuff in life doesn't matter. Um, another thing that really, really hit me uh, was like around day 22 or 23 in rehab, I realized the world didn't fall apart without me in it. And this was a big one. I, I prided myself on, I'm Marcus Kummel. I do this and I do that. And I, you know, have these businesses and, you know, people are going to struggle without me. And I realized no one really gave a shit. No yep. one cared. My family didn't even know. We decided not to tell them for you know good reasons um and i was just kind of like hey this is cool 
I don't have to be stressed about all these things I'm stressed about. And later on, um, I think what rehab did for me is it paved the way for what was about to come. Because before rehab, I had started listening to these talks um, by these people were, that were kind of like strange, but had good things to say. Like uh, one of the people I listened to was the founder of the S training. And for those that don't know, Terry, I don't know if you'll remember, but back in the 80s, there was this thing called the S training, uh, E-S-T, in San Francisco area uh, by this uh, guy. It was like a self-help kind of thing. And this guy was known for being in the news all the time because you'd go in for self-help. You'd pay for a weekend of self-help. You'd go there, and the trainers would treat you like crap. They wouldn't let you have a back of the room break. They wouldn't let you eat. They'd keep you there for 14 hours. And while his methods were archaic and not exactly what I do, um, the, the idea was good. Right. The idea that he had behind it was I'm going to make you face whatever you think your worst fear is so that you could realize that it's really nothing. Like you're in this hotel room with all these people and you're afraid of getting up and talking, even though you're never going to see these people again. What's the problem? And so I started listening to these people before rehab. I went to rehab. Rehab kind of taught me something because for some weird reason, um, the people in the rehab, there was like all these counselors and stuff, and I heard about other rehabs, but for some reason, some cosmic whatever reason, um, I get stuck with this guy who looks like a hippie burnout. You're like, dude, you've been in the, the hate too long, you know? Been smoking the weed a little too long, buddy. Um, but great guy. And I looked at him, and I'm like, whatever, hippie burnout. This guy doesn't know much. Guy had like five PhDs from six different countries, studied philosophy, spoke six different languages. And I was like, this is this is going to be my rehab coach. And I remember I, I, I met him and I had a different coach and I had told the people, hey, I want to switch coaches. And they're like, OK, you can switch coaches. And later on, he told me, he's like, you can't switch coaches. I wanted you in my group. Like I, I, I saw you and you're like, and I was like, you need to be in my group. And so I listened to him. And one of the things that I learned was being able to listen to someone that I, I wouldn't normally listen to being able to look at someone who's like, dude, just rolled off the hate. And, you know, and for those that don't know, we're talking about hate Ashbury in San Francisco, which if you've been there, you know, interesting people, good people. Um, maybe they have something to say that can help us. Maybe just maybe their life experience opened up something for them in their consciousness that we don't have access to, and we might need to hear it from them. And that's something I learned in rehab was, wow, I can listen to this guy. And not because he's smart, not because he's got all these PhDs, because he has this experience with alcohol and drugs that I have not experienced. He's got 27 years sober. And I remember thinking to myself, I have nothing if I don't have a day sober. I have nothing. If I'm drunk, my consciousness has changed. And so I started listening to these uh, S trainings, which before, the reason I got into this is I had a therapist who was kind of an interesting person. It was a life coach with the quotes. We'll put those quotes on them. And this life coach had all these ideas and everything. And she invited me one time to this seminar. And I go to this seminar and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I've heard this stuff. I know this stuff. And later on, I was like, this is from that thing my dad went to, the S training back in the 80s. I, I know this stuff. And so my job was to prove out why this philosophy of life was wrong. Right? And I was like, okay, this is wrong because of all this. And I didn't listen. Right? There was some good things. There were some bad things. Just like with everything, when rehab, there was some good advice and there was some bullshit advice. Oh, yeah. And so after rehab, I started listening to this guy and I found out that his philosophy came from Alan Watts, it was just like packaged for rich people instead of like people that do sit in the, in the park and, and hang out. And so I started listening to Alan Watts and I started realizing that this entire life that I built, and this was a byproduct of rehab. Rehab opened up the way to say, and, and this wasn't just rehab. It was rehab. It was mental institute. It was almost uh, ending my life. It was being taken into custody by the police because I couldn't function. And all these things led to me saying everything in my life is a complete and utter nothing. 
like, here I am, Mr. Guy who, who has to wear pants. I remember the day I went in to the mental hospital. I made the cops take me upstairs because I'm like, I'm not going to the hospital in sweats. I don't do that. I wear shoes that are tied with pants that are nice and pressed. And um, I remember uh, realizing, okay, so Marcus the Great is in a mental hospital. And I remember thinking it was a big deal, big deal. People are going to find out. And then I realized, so what? So what if people know that I'm human and I'm susceptible to alcoholism and stress? So what if people know this stuff? And that's not to say you need to be an open book about everything. I remember years ago when I used to be a preacher, we had this guy who was like 19, and he'd show up at the Bible study, and he'd tell everyone all his sins. And they're like, you know, buddy, you know, you could just give us the overview. Just be like, hey, I got a problem in this area. We don't need to know the specifics. Don't need to know it. We're good. Um, but I realized that all of this stuff that we build ourselves up to be, this life that we've built, this person, this suit we put on to show to the world, means nothing. Right. It's all society. It's nothing. And, and I realized that, like, all the stress that you have, look at, take the top 10 things you're stressed about. Wife, money, uh, whatever's going on in the, the election, all that. And tell yourself, I live on the same planet as a kid in India who has no food and has to dig through scraps every day. Like, his whole day is digging through scraps of old computers, cutting his feet up, to find enough copper to get food. And I'm worried about getting a bigger Mercedes or a bigger this or a bigger that, bigger house, more carpet, thick carpet. And it's like, for what? And we realize that we bought this lie that everything in our life put on us that is all this stuff outside of you will make you happy. When you get the car, you'll be happy. When you get the girl, you're going to be happy. When you get the guy, you're going to be happy. When you get that house, you're going to be happy. When you retire, psh, sit back, put your feet up, and retire. Actually, some of the most miserable people I know are retired people. Just saying. Interesting. We wait. That's our golden years. We find out they're like the brown years because it's pretty crappy. And... I mean that in the way of saying not good years um, because a lot of people are like, I don't know what to do with the boredom. I don't know what to do with myself. All my life, I have been Marcus, the businessman. What's going to happen when I retire and I'm not Marcus, the businessman or Bob, the stockbroker or Terry, the chef? What am I going to be? How am I going to live? Well, you learn to live by saying, I am not what society says I am. I'm not what you say I am. I'm not even what I say I am. I don't even know what the hell I am. I do know I'm some kind of chemical, animal, spiritual being thing, right? I think that's like, we'll put that in the dictionary as the actual definition. Um, and I know I'm susceptible to certain things, like the big powerful Marcus can be brought to his knees with a couple of drinks. Yep. About that brought to my knees with a couple of drinks can you be brought to your knees by a couple of drinks if so what are you protecting what are we trying to protect like that's what i am that's what you are that's what terry is like i know for a fact if things went bad politically or whatever and we had no access to food in five days you would not recognize me I might even drink. I might take away food for five days. I, I don't know what would happen because I don't know and I can't control what happens when my mind is altered chemically and hunger alters your mind chemically. I don't know what would happen. I'm not prepared for that. I'd like to sit here and say, well, I'd be sober, of course. I've been sober six years and I run talk sober. I, you know, nothing can get me. Anything can get me. Terry, what are your thoughts on that? I've been talking too long. 
<laughs> what are my thoughts on what? <laughs> no, uh, you know, you're talking a lot about ego and humility. And um, yeah, that's that's something I had to develop in sobriety. When I was drinking, you know, you're talking about the bigger Mercedes and all that. And when I was drinking, I wanted the the bigger house, the bigger, bigger car, the, you know, better of everything, the awesome stereo system, you know, and that was all to boost my ego. And, you know, people would say, hey, man, nice, nice car you got there. I'd be like, thanks, man. Thanks. What What am I thanking? I mean, I, I don't, I don't. Nowadays, people say, hey, nice car, man. And I'm like. I don't know how to answer because it's okay. Maybe it's a nice car, but um, that's not who I am. It's, I'm, I'm not about the car. I'm not about the house. I'm about uh, what I, I don't know, what I do for people and how I act. And that's what I try to do now. I don't know that I do that 100% or even 50%, but that's what I try to do is just try to be a better person. And, you know, that helps my feeling of gratitude and um and helps my sobriety immensely. That's, that's what's huge in my life right now is just, I'm trying to keep my ego in check, trying to, um, stay humble and understand that I don't have all the answers thought I did when I was drinking, but my answer was always to go get another bottle and I, I'll take care of that tomorrow. And that was, that was my answer for years. And still, I had to put on this persona of, I'm good, I'm okay, everything's great, I can do this all myself, until eventually I was doing it, well, I wasn't doing it, but I was just all by myself, driven everybody out of my life, and um, it took a complete ego smashing and complete humility to, to uh, finally get a solution that was going to help me, and that was that going to rehab, and that, that started me on the the journey and going to rehab, I thought it, things were going to come out of rehab and things going to be wonderful and I'm going to become rich and famous and all that stuff. And no, that didn't happen. But I learned to be happy with uh, what I have. And, you know, I was fortunate that I didn't lose everything. I came close, almost even lost my life. But but when I got sober, I was just able to be happy with what I have and start to build things slowly and patiently and you know just do that that was that was important for me absolutely and so yeah and uh we do have like almost 70 people on here so you are a little famous oh, just a tad so <laughs> <laughs> famous right now um, hey, I Naomi, give... congratulations on 938 days awesome and I, I wanted to bring up naomi too because um i think she changed her name because she got married uh, but this is the same Naomi, I believe, that started out three years ago when we started these talks. And I remember seeing her on here posting, I'm on day eight, I'm on day nine, day 11, and now she's got almost three years. And that's just amazing to see that someone who can't stop drinking has been sober for three years, almost, pretty close. I don't know, do the math. Um, but that's just a testament to, you know, changing your mindset and understanding how this works and understanding that, you know, you have these thoughts in your mind and you have these thoughts like, like D S A D S says, I want beer. That's a thought in your mind. And you think you need to act on it because I really want a beer. And I mean, damn it, this is America. I get what I want. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we need to stop giving ourselves everything we want. Maybe we need to stop living by our desires and our feelings at the moment. Right? Very, very important. And Naomi says, yes, she is the same Naomi. It used to be Naomi White. Uh, yeah, great to see you here. I mean, I, I remember those days when you would come on and you would say, you know, three days sober, four days sober. I'm just listening to you guys. I'm trying to, trying to do this stuff. Um, and, you know, that's amazing to see that almost three years. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Congrats on that. Congrats on the move and the marriage and, and all that good stuff. Um, right let's on. see. Any other? Uh, Chef Monty says, I yeah. relapsed yesterday, had four months sober, sober uh, bummed about it. One thing I will say to the relapsing person is, you know, don't dwell on it because it's in the past. Yeah. Any one of us can relapse at any moment. It's what we do next that matters. Some people, they wallow in it and they say, screw it, I've, I've already drank, I might as well drink. And 
that doesn't lead us to good. But if you look at it and you're like, hey, I had a minor setback. Doesn't mean I lost what the last four months gave me. Right? It doesn't erase it all. You still have the experience of being down and out, drinking, getting sober, staying sober for a while, and a relapse. You still have that, which is pretty important. Yeah, a lot of times a relapse can be, uh, uh, well, I don't really want to say blessing in disguise, but it can be part of your road to recovery. I mean, I relapsed after that, that rehab, and um, it was a big part of my recovery because I did learn that I am an alcoholic. I cannot control it. And that's what I thought I could do. And uh, two days later, I was back to full blast. So, you know, it, it's, it, can be a, it can be an important, important lesson. But just start where you are right now, Chef. That's, you can get sober right now. You can stay sober. It, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. Just like Marcus said, just move forward and try, try to get sober again. And uh, for DSADS, he says, I was three years sober, but been slipping lately. Well, there's a lot going on lately. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Like, I was pretty amazed I was able to make it through that presidential debate without drinking <laughs> something. <laughs> um, you know, you got the lockdown, you got people without work, um, all kinds of stressful things. And a buddy of mine, when I used to preach, said, uh, you know, when it rains, it pours. And sometimes it does seem that way yeah. when something happens, you know, like people are saying, screw 2020, 2020 just sucks. Uh, well, 21, uh, 2020 it doesn't suck or it's just a number on paper that people invented. doesn't mean anything. There is no 2020. People just decided there'd be 365 days in a year. It doesn't mean anything. November or uh, uh, January 1st doesn't mean anything. Today doesn't mean anything. What means something? Am I going to stay sober? And like Naomi says, I relapsed two times before I finally got this to stick. And back to 938 days sober, it's so easy now to live life sober. Absolutely. And, you know, this is one of the toughest years people have faced. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit you. Uh, DSADS says, I just didn't see any point in being sober. Um, well, I mean, that would come with a new life philosophy. What is it that you're valuing in your life? Is it money? Are you like, okay, well, it's not worth it to stay sober because I lost everything. Is it uh, a relationship? It's not worth it to stay sober because, you know, the damn wife is always yelling at me or whatever. Um, it's, it's not worth it to stay sober because of this. I would look at what the because is. It's not, uh, there's no point to being sober because. Answer that because and you're going to find out a flaw in your life philosophy. My life philosophy used to be, literally, you are worth as much as in, in is, is in your checking account. That's what I thought. I was like, okay, my life insurance is worth more than my bank account. It's time to check out. It's literally how I thought. I was trained to think that way. That's what society and life and the, the path that I was on taught me, and it was very toxic. And it wasn't until later that I realized I needed a new life philosophy because I thought, okay, well, then I just need more money to fix it. Just fix it. Just throw more money at it. I'll fix it. That's going to do it. And then I realized, well, you know, maybe that philosophy is flawed. Maybe, just maybe, God or the universe or whatever created me not to just go collect papers of presidents that are worth money and worth something because people say it's worth something, right? Maybe there's something else at play here. Maybe there's more value to me than who I am or what people say I am or what I think or what I have. Maybe there's more. And these are the things that keep us drunk. And I think it's deeper than just stinking thinking. Because stinking thinking, I mean, you know, okay, that's cute, right? Nice t-shirt. But really, what's happening? And uh, DSEA, DS, that one, says, I didn't change much. Anything, just stop drinking. Maybe that's why. Maybe. Could be. Right? What was it that caused you? What was it that, that made you go drink? What was the thought process? What is it that you value? You know, what is, what is that? And maybe it's time to change it. And what I did when I got out of rehab, I deliberately said I'm going to change my mind. And every day without fail, I've even been in hotels where I forgot my headphones and I just listened to it on my phone, on speaker. 
And I listen to a talk every night. I do not fall asleep without listening to a talk or an audiobook that's about my new way of thinking because I don't want to lose that. I don't want to forget that. And it's easy to forget it. It's so easy. Something happens, you know, you're like, hey, I'm doing okay. Now I got this Zen life. Everything's good. I'm feeling good. Nothing's going to mess with me. Then, you know, the virus happens. Eh, okay, so now we're home. Then the government's like, we're going to give you a quarter. You can have a quarter. And you're like, okay, that'll last me a minute. Maybe I'll make a phone call on one of those old phones that Marcus and Terry remember. Um, okay, I'm still, I'm still zen. Okay, now you don't work anymore. Okay. Okay, it's starting to hurt a little bit. Okay, now your bank account's dried up. Yeah, now we're not even going to give you a second stimulus. As if $1,200 was enough to make it more than 15 minutes for anyone anyway. And now you're screwed. And if your life philosophy is bent, that's going to take you for a loop. And that's going to take you for a ride. My life philosophy has changed. I like to think it's strong. It still took me for a ride a couple days. I've had more bad days since this stuff has happened than I've had my entire sobriety combined. But I cling to that and I say, no matter what, even if I feel like shit, even I don't feel like this, I'm going to listen to this anyway. Even if I think Marcus and Terry are weird people, right? Those California people, although I'm in Florida now, right? There's a bunch of weirdos. But we have to look at it and say, I'm going to listen to something, whatever it is that's going to put new thoughts in your head because the old thoughts aren't working. All right. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, so honestly, uh, even though I slipped, I feel like I'm still on the journey to sobriety, and um, that's what you just said, and that's that's awesome. It, you know, that for me, that was it too. There was... There were some bumps in the road, and like like Marcus, since the beginning of the pandemic, there's there's definitely been bumps in the road. Even this morning, I woke up to the sound of rain. It hasn't rained in my area in uh, months, and it wasn't raining today. It was rain in my kitchen, and so I got to deal with that. But you know, it's I don't have control over that. I can fix it now, and that's uh, my my day. My plans for the day have changed. That's what I'm going to do today. But you know, that's. That's one of the things that's changed in my life since I got sober. When I first got sober, I had to change the way I thought. I thought, because they said the only thing you have to change is everything. That's what they told us in rehab. And I'm like, really? You mean I don't get to go on hikes and do all this, that, this and that and go on bike rides and all that? No, that's not the case at all. I'm still able to live my life that way. But I had to change the way I looked at things. I had to enjoy those bike rides. When I um, when I don't have anything to do, which in early sobriety, that was I had a lot of time on my hands because I was unemployable still. So no job, no nothing. I didn't have anything to do. Um, I had to get busy. And uh, for me, that was going to meetings. There's a hospital group meetings. I went to the AA meetings, too. I went to I did everything. And um, and the key with doing all that stuff was I reached out to people. I talked to people. I stayed open-minded for what they had to say. I did. I really concentrated on not um, not focusing on things that they're saying that I don't agree with. I just let it come in, and that's okay. If I don't agree with what they're talking about, the God thing or whatever, I just let it go. And that was part of my uh, my journey into sobriety was just staying open-minded and positive and. Having that feeling of gratitude, the fact that I don't have to go get a drink right now, I'm okay. And what am I going to do the rest of the day? I definitely can't go and sit in front of the TV and watch bad TV because that's what I used to do when I drank. I got to stay away from that stuff. And that was a lot of what I did to stay sober, especially in the beginning. And nowadays, I do the same thing. I stay busy, keep doing things towards my sobriety, trying to help other people. Whether it's in sobriety or people trying to get sober, just helping my wife because she's working her butt off right now. So I just, you know, do dishes, fix the sink, <laughs> things like that. 
Absolutely. And guys, if you are getting value and you think these talks are helping you and you want to help out the channel and get all kinds of cool stuff to help you get and stay sober, we have created a 30-day course that is almost complete. I got a couple others we're working on, um, but you can go in and you can support the channel and get access to PDFs, uh, MP3s, and daily uh, worksheets and everything about how to get and stay sober. This is based on a book that I'm writing about uh, 30 days to sobriety. Um, of course, it's not a guarantee, obviously. The sobriety success rate is like, you know, pretty slim. Um, but I think this will help you. If you guys resonate with what we're talking about, this course is based on that. So if you're like, hey, this makes sense to me, you know, all the other stuff doesn't make sense to me, but this does, uh, I think it could definitely help you. And if you do want to join that, click on the yellow, go to talksober.com, click on the big yellow button. It'll pull up the order form. And for less than the price of a cheap beer at home, not even a, you know, at the bar or anything, because those are like nine bucks each, uh, but for the cost of a cheap beer a day at home, you can get the tools and help support the channel with what we're doing here. Uh, it is a monthly thing. You can cancel whenever you like just by going to the site and asking, and you will get instant access to all the stuff that's in there for you. Also, if you feel like you want to have a call with Terry and I personally, you can click on private sobriety call with Marcus and Terry. Um, and I think it's only like 97 bucks. You can get on the call with us, talk about whatever you want uh, as pertains to sobriety, and we'll help you with that. Uh, there's also some other resources here of Should I Go to Rehab. You can download some of my letters, join our Facebook group. You could log in to Talk Sober and get product support and everything like that. So TalkSober.com, click the big yellow button, help support the channel, and get the tools to get and stay sober. Even if you've been sober for a while, I think this is very important to your mindset because there will be things that you'll learn in there that'll say, wow, I didn't think about that before. And as I learned in rehab, uh, he was watching me take notes on everything and he said, you know, Marcus, you only need a few good ideas to beat this. Just a few. You don't need knowledges or mountains of books. Just a few. Uh, Alpha says, I spent more than $27 a day on alcohol. Right there with you, buddy. I don't even like to think about how much my alcohol cost. It just is kind of depressing. Um, so yeah, uh, remember to hit that like button. As Derek says, give us a thumbs up, help this go out to other alcoholics and, uh, we'll get you guys rocking and rolling. And Terry, you want to take a couple others before we wrap up? Sure. Uh, one just came up. Yan Lee, uh, Giyu or Gilu. Thank you for all your help. Been listening to you guys for a while. I was drinking at least one bottle of wine a day, plus other things sometimes. Finally, now I'm able to moderate my drinking. Well, good for you. That's awesome. I can't moderate. Um, my moderation would never work. I tried that for so long. And I'm a true alcoholic, so I have to. Uh, I have to completely stay away. But if you're able to moderate, that's awesome. Great, and good and, job. And I'm glad. Glad we're helping you out. Uh, just a word of warning: um, Don't try to moderate just because someone else can. Um, if I tried to moderate, I'd be drunk today. I yep. know that for a fact. Um, and so, you know, don't mess with it. Be careful. Even when I started looking at uh, non-alcoholic beers, um, I was very careful about it. I told people around me, hey, you know, I want to watch these um, because it can be risky. Um, and some people, you know, that is a hard part for them. So focus on what it is for you. If you know you can't moderate, don't keep proving it to yourself that you can't moderate. All right? I don't need to prove it to myself anymore. So there you go. Uh, Dean and uh, Dannon asking me how strong my coffee is in the morning. I may have to ease up a bit as it does affect mood a bit. <laughs> um, how strong is my coffee? I didn't know there was a strength level. I guess I make a normal cup of coffee and I do drink too much coffee, but I'm not uh, terrible. And I have my last cup early afternoon because it will keep me awake if I keep drinking it. Um, but I know Marcus doesn't drink coffee at all. I actually it, do. Uh, I have one today. Oh, okay. uh, off and on. <laughs> uh, moderation, do, yeah. moderation with anything is really the best answer. It is is what I would go with. But you know, if it's affecting you, I mean, alcohol was affecting me. It was going to destroy my life. It was going to end my life. Is coffee going to do that? I don't think so. But um, I do. I try not to drink too much. I find that if I just drink coffee all morning, I don't feel that good in the afternoon. Got to drink, put some water in there and stuff like that, you know, healthy stuff. So, yeah, too much caffeine is probably not a good idea. 
Absolutely. Uh, one other, uh, Steve says, the problem is you know what to do, but you end up not doing it because you think the risks aren't that bad and you can take a chance and you think it's worth it because you like to drink. Absolutely. I yeah. like to drink. I still, you know, uh, that's why after five years sober, I, I started having non-alcoholic beers um, because I did miss the taste. Like, you know, I, I was, I loved different microbreweries and stuff. And you really couldn't get that with like soda. It's like you get Coke and Pepsi and they're not all that much different. Um, so that was something I did miss. But, uh, you know, the risks of actually drinking alcohol uh, are really bad. Like, look at Terry and I. Mental Institute, suicide attempt. Uh, Terry's got major seizure stuff he dealt with. Um, and we're just normal guys like you. There's no different. Just drink a lot of alcohol. And so you got to look at it and say, what am I going to do? And it has to do with the protection against that first drink. What are you going to do to not have the first drink? Because the first one's the tricky one. The rest are easy. You're already one in. You're going to keep drinking. We know that. We've proven it to ourselves. But if we stop at that first one and say, I'm not going to have the first one, no matter how, you know, my mind's going to play tricks on me, got in a fight with the spouse, I deserve a drink. I, I deserve one. Or I'd like one. Or it's only one, right? We got to look at the things that our mind plays tricks on us with and say, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm not going to do it. Have I heard of spontaneous sobriety? I have. Yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, it never happened to me. No. Nope. It would have been nice, but. <laughs> yeah, Maybe don't 30 wait for years some... ago, it happened to me occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, uh, don't bank on it. You know, while you're waiting for your spontaneous sobriety. Do it the slow way. You might learn something. Yeah, there's, there's a, you know, obviously AA is a huge, um, that's a huge thing in society today for getting sober, but there, there are other alternatives. There's our program. There's, there's lots of programs out there. Um, I would encourage people to uh, not shun any way of getting sober. Um, it works for some certain ways give work for some certain ways don't work for some. Uh, but you know what I did when I got sober is I just did everything I could. I tried not to, um, have that contempt prior to investigation. You know, I, I made sure I tried something and if it didn't work out for me, like, you know, I went to the hospital, um, the hospital program that they had group meetings and I went there for a few months and it was effective for me. Until it really wasn't as, that as effective for me. So I just kind of stopped doing that. I would never tell anybody to not go to those things. I think they were very, very helpful. And I think they continue to be helpful for a lot of people. And I just chose to go a different route. And so I would encourage people, do anything you can to get sober. Try everything for getting sober. Um, and, the, you know, the main thing is, is we really need help doing it because we're trying to get sober with a, a sick mind and it's important to get a, a sober intelligent uh, trained mind in there to help us on that journey and that's going to help your success a lot absolutely all right guys thanks for being here stay sober go to talksober.com sign up for the course help support the channel get tons of cool resources to get and stay sober if you need anything let us know keep your comments flowing on the channel keep those thumbs up coming so that YouTube sends us out to other alcoholics, and we'll see you guys next week here at on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time. See you guys next time. Stay sober. Thanks, everybody.